IIT is a boutique education advisory that helps aspiring students get accepted into top tier education institutions globally for high school, undergraduate, masters, MBA, and from Sh Shulik School of Business. Hi, both. Thank you so much for making the time for us today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we start, can we just have the two of you give us a little bit of your background? Karan, go, you go first. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Imran. Uh, hi, guys. Good evening. Good morning, wherever you're uh, joining us from. Uh, as Ananya has already mentioned that I've been working with Shulik. Uh, we take care of, so I'm based out of Hyderabad campus here in India, and we take care of the entire MBA in India program, what we have specifically, including the recruitment and the uh, program delivery here in India. We also recruit for the Toronto MBA program, and also uh, anybody uh, uh, submitting the application from India, maybe Southeast Asia. So that's what we look into. And here we are there to actually help you out with all your questions if you have regarding your ap applications and so on and so forth. I'm sure you have done your research regarding the schools already. So in case you have any questions regarding the application or any other uh, questions regarding the employment uh, report or anything on those lines, we are here to help you out with that. Thank you. All right, morning everyone. Um, Ananya kindly introduced me already, but my name is Imran Kanga. I am the Director of Recruitment and Admissions for the full-time MBA program um, at Rotman. So myself and my team, we manage uh, the recruitment and admissions process for uh, a cohort of 300 students that we intake every year, once, once every year in the fall. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, while I'm here to chat about the full-time MBA program, we also do have um, various other programs um, uh, at the master's level as well as executive level that um, I don't know have all the details about, but I'm more than happy to answer as many questions as I can um, about those programs as well as the, the full-time MBA. So thank you, Ananya, again for, uh, for inviting me to be here. Thanks, Karan. Thanks, Imran. Um, so just for the benefit of everyone who's joined us today, the structure of this uh, session is going to be that the first half, Karan, Imran and I are going to have a conversation generally about applications, about what to expect, about what the universities are looking for. And uh, whilst we're having that conversation, I'd urge everyone to sort of drop their questions on the chat box and we'll pick them up uh, towards the second half of the session. Um, so let's dive right into it. Um, so let's start with you, Imran. Um, this year, what are the applications looking like and what are you expecting from students uh, coming in? Um, so uh, when you say this year, <laughs> our <laughs> application cycle actually just uh, just opened up last week. So uh, it's very early to say, you know, it's, a, it's very early to, uh, to tell like what our applica uh, applicant pool is looking like uh, so far. But, uh, you know, uh, I've, so I've been at Rotman for about three years now, and uh, I've, you know, I've noticed a trend every year. Uh, we're receiving more applications, you know, uh, more applications, as well as, um, you know, very, very strong, very competitive applications. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of applicant trends, I think this cycle is going to be harder for us as a, as a team because it's, you know, it's it's really hard to to, to pick candidates for uh, you know limited number of, of spots, but uh, uh, yeah, you know, I'm I'm expecting it to be um, another you know uh, another strong year in admissions. Uh, I think because Canada is kind of on the upswing now with uh, with the pandemic, you know, where we are seeing a lot more international applications come in as well. Uh, I mean, if I'm comparing, you know. Uh, this time last year, year-over-year um, year comparison, we're definitely seeing a lot more international applications come in early. Um, I think, you know, obviously there has been, there, uh, there are, there have been delays with the um, study permit processing and all of that. So I think, you know, international students are aware of that. And so they're, they're just being a lot more proactive and applying early. So that's something I've noticed so far, but it, again, it's, it's been like eight days, so. <laughs> Hard to draw any like hard conclusions from that, but <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully this gives a you know head start to all the participants that have joined us today. Um, just from what you said, so when you said limited capacity uh, in the upcoming year, are we looking at hundred percent capacity uh, for for the next intake, or uh, is it going to be limited 
uh, some online classes, some in person. What are we expecting? Of course, it's difficult to say with uh, what to expect with COVID, but as the situation is right now. Yeah, um, I mean, as it is right now, and I think it's the same up at York as well, uh, we are somewhat in a, in a hybrid mode, um, you know, where uh, we have 100%, like 100 of our, our students will have some uh, on-campus uh, engagement. So, you know, the way we work is we have sections. So the 300 students are divided into four sections you know, and based on capacity limits, uh, you know, so I, I think the way they've planned it is like, you know, sections one and two will be on campus this week, sections three and four will be online. And then the following week, you know, sections three and four will be on campus and the first two sections will be online. So they're rotating it out so that, you know, every, all students have access to the building, are able to, you know, uh, meet with their professors, uh, meet with their classmates uh, and, and, you know, still get that in-person uh, experience. Now, this is, so Canada currently is in phase three with, uh, you know, somewhat of uh, limited uh, capacities and, and all of that. Once we move into stage four, uh, I, I believe most of those uh, limits uh, and restrictions will be lifted. So I think we are hopeful that, uh, you know, that we'll be able to just offer more and more in-person um, you know, activities and, and classes as, as we move into further stages and reopening, so. Great. Um, and Karan, uh, moving to you, so what do you see the applications looking like for the winter intake, um, actually, like if you could tell us a little more about that. Yeah, so we are yet to start our application for fall. Uh, so I won't have any idea what's been happening. So we might go online with our application by early next week, or the application uh, portal should be open. For winter intake, uh, for January 2022 winter intake, what we have noticed is, again, uh, what Imran, I would actually echo the same thoughts here. The number of people applying uh, to Shulik, it has increased drastically. And the number of people applying from India specifically, that has gone up, is what, right. what we have noticed. It has gone up at least like two times or three times what we have seen in the last couple of years here. And uh, yes, that does increase uh, the pool of competition for the students. And yes, it does make our job even uh, uh, difficult for us because it's too difficult to let go of a really good application as well because, but the number of seats is limited. So you have to uh, take those calls, but students have been kind enough. They generally opt to roll over the application to the next intake. So that's where they are able to uh, still uh, get a seat in the program. So that, has, that is something which has been good for us as well. And uh, in terms of starting the campus, uh, again, we, uh, we both fall under the same guidelines. So we do have a hybrid model uh, for fall intake. Yeah. So the fall classes uh, would be with a limited capacity. And we, even though the government has allowed us to actually start uh, 100%, so we are still taking baby steps right now, starting with minimum capacity, 50% capacity uh, on campus, but making sure that the students are vaccinated when they come on campus. And uh, towards the winter is when we are planning to go 100% uh, offline with the classes as well. Right. And um, speaking of vaccination, so um, if a student um, uh, isn't able to get both their shots before coming uh, to university, what's the kind of uh, you know, support system that both these universities are providing students that are coming in? So uh, in terms of Shulik, very recently, I guess uh, yesterday I was having a con uh, conversation with our immigration officer and she just informed me that uh, before entering Canada, you need to have the vaccination. Now. Right. You need to be fully vaccinated before entering Canada. So that's the latest update, what I know as of yesterday. So uh, in case uh, if you happen to be in Canada and if you have not uh, va been vaccinated yet, we have tied up with a local hospital. So they are setting up their camps on campus itself. You can take the vaccination on campus. I guess what they are uh, providing right now is with Pfizer, if I'm not wrong. Right. So you can, you can still get the vaccination done on campus as well. So you don't have to literally go out and visit any clinic or hospital. The, we have our own uh, camp set up on the campus itself. First perfect, perfect. I think that makes life easier for all the students coming in. Uh, yeah. What about you, Imran? Is it the same sort of uh, strategy with Rotman as well? Yeah, I, you know, we, um, so uh, again, we also recently um, got the update from, uh, you, you know, U of T Central that uh, students would be required to be vaccinated uh, on, on campus, especially if they're in residence. Yeah. Um, 
But uh, you know, for students who don't have a double vaccine before they come here, uh, so I think the difference is really if you are double vaccinated, you don't need to quarantine when you arrive. If you're not double vaccinated or, you know, I know a lot of students coming in this year who who just arrived over the past few days. Um, our, our class, our program just kicked off uh, on Monday, actually. So uh, we've been dealing with a lot of this. Um, but yeah, students who are uh, not double vaccinated or have like the co-vaccine, which is not WHO approved, uh, have to quarantine and then uh, get vaccinated once they're here. So, um, you know, um, international students are eligible to get a, get vaccinated in Canada for free. So it's just about booking an appointment. You know, once you're out of quarantine, you book an appointment to go get your vaccine, and and then you know that then uh, allows you to go into into the into the building, uh, right? Into and all of that. And we also have like a, you know, for for students who don't want to be vaccinated. I mean, they have to do like a U check, which is kind of like that questionnaire that now you have to do before entering like uh, restaurants or, or uh, you know, places of business. Um, so they have to just do like a, a quick questionnaire, like, you know, have you been exposed uh, to anyone with COVID in the last 14 days, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, so it's an extra step for those who haven't been vaccinated, but, you know, our, our, we are encouraging all of our students to just get double vaccinated for the safety for themselves and the, you know, and the U of T community. So. Right, right. So uh, I'm just going to repeat for everyone uh, that Covaxin, because it's not WHO approved, uh, is going to be a bit of a problem. So if you're not vaccinated yet, try and get the COVID shield and yeah. uh, you'll be good to go for Canadian universities then. Um, now, with the entire COVID situation, it has put a lot of financial constraint on students, right? So a lot of questions that we as counselors are getting these days is about what's the kind of financial aid that universities are providing, if at all, um, or if that has increased uh, given the current situation. So um, could the two of you sort of shed some, shed some light on that? I mean, I think, you know... <clears throat> Uh, we did we did provide a lot of sort of additional support to students who entered the program last year because they were entering um, you know a complete virtual environment. So uh, you know I remember we we had given all students like a thousand dollar IT credit. You know um, upgrade your internet if you need to buy another device or something like that um, uh, to make sure that you know you're able to to sign on to classes and that you have uninterrupted. Um, you know, you have an uninterrupted sort of technical experience. Uh, we, I, you know, students had to do a lot more online uh, networking. So we paid for LinkedIn premium accounts for all our students. Um, you know, and then of course uh, we had quarantine accommodations um, ready for our students when they arrived. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we were giving these kind of bursaries that, that um, uh, you know, enable students to, to start the program and have a seamless experience. Uh, this year, because, um, you know, we're, we're not virtual anymore or not completely virtual um, and students are on campus about, you know, over two thirds of our students are currently in Toronto. So yeah. uh, they now started the program. So and, you know, I think the other one third are planning on coming in over the next uh, few weeks. So, uh, you know, uh, and companies now are also beginning to, to have more in-person, on-campus interactions. So, um, in terms of financial aid, most of our financial aid this year has moved from sort of, you know, bursaries to help students with COVID to just financial aid at, at the entrance award level. And, uh, you know, uh, at Rotman, we, we provide um, over $6 million in financial aid to our, you know, incoming class, um, ranging from like $5,000 to full scholarship. Um, and this year, the incoming class, the average uh, scholarship was $23,000. So, right. so, yeah, plenty of financial aid available for students. Perfect. Perfect. And um, what about uh, at uh, Shulik, Karan? So at Shulik, uh, specifically, uh, we have uh, scholarship and awards across the university, which goes up more than $4 million. Uh, for all the students uh, coming in, and it could be domestic uh, international students. But when it comes to international students specifically, uh, we have uh, achievement or merit-based scholarships only for international students. So that's the bifurcation there. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, MBA in India program, what we have, so every uh, everyone joining the MBA in India program, they do get a 10,000 uh, bursary. 
uh, which uh, what we call as Dean Scholarship the moment they join the program. So that's the scholarship what they are offered if they join MBA in India program. That's a differentiation there. But uh, apart from that, even if you're joining the Toronto cohort, you would get scholarship which is ranging from 5,000 to 10,000 to 20,000. That's been part of it. Uh, one of the interesting things what we uh, recently uh, included, so apart from the entrance scholarship to the continuing scholarship, even the convocation scholarship of these three uh, different scholarship what we have, we also included uh, something on the lines of Chromba scholarship. So it's a special scholarship for those candidates who belong to the LGBTQ community or if they are if they're part of the community or if they are an ally to the community, if they have done some uh, good work around the community itself and uplifting the community. And if they are able to justify that during the interview process or something on those lines, so that's uh, a, a way to actually get Romba scholarship and other scholarship as well. So that's, that's just a way. Yeah, that's that's a, a way where school would want to have that diversity. And the LGBTQ community in, uh, on campus is very strong, yeah. and they do work uh, towards uplifting the community there. So we just would want to have more candidates who can actually help the other uh, students here on campus as well. So that's something which is very unique to Shul here. Wow, that's really interesting. And um, you mentioned the MBA in India program. Could you tell us a little more about it in terms of um, how it's structured? Do the students have the same faculty as the uh, people in Canada, uh, as their colleagues in Canada? Or what's, what's the uh, structure? Is it only India? Is it mixed? Like, shed some light on that. Right. So uh, when we talk about MBA in India specifically, so there is no differentiation in terms of applying for the program. You would apply the same way if you are applying for the Toronto MBA program. So you would apply the same way for MBA in India as well. The only difference is you have an opportunity to complete your term one and term two in India itself, in a Hyderabad campus. And uh, this is in association with GMR, which is the largest infrastructure group what we know in India. So uh, GMR Business School. And uh, the eight months of program, what you would be doing here in India, even that program is approved by EICTE as well. So technically, and the curriculum is designed by Sholek. The faculty is flown down from Sholek to India to our Hyderabad campus. And the, the same faculty is teaching here uh, in Hyderabad as well. So you have an opportunity to pursue your program uh, in dual economy, I would say. So yeah. it's ideally brilliant for those candidates who would want to uh, move to Canada and right. spend some time there, five years, 10 years, 15 years, and then eventually move back to India as well. So this uh, could be a very good program for those candidates. But yeah. again, it uh, totally depends on you, how you would want to do that. Uh, as I've already mentioned, they do get 10,000 bursary if they actually offer this program. And once you graduate, you get the same degree out of it. And uh, whatever the uh, work permit you would, be, you would have been eligible for, if you would have been doing both the years in Canada, you are uh, eligible for the same work permit if you do MBA in India program as well. Okay, so there's no, um, I, I don't see any downside particularly or in terms of employment, at least if someone chooses to do the MBA in India instead. Not at all, actually, in terms of employment. Uh, surprisingly, MBA in India students, they actually score the highest job is what we have seen. Uh, oh, wow. they, uh, they, they actually uh, get placed after completing their program. Uh, again, just a heads up, uh, we are officially not allowed to talk about immigration because it comes under uh, uh, Canadian government here. But uh, in case if you are applying for your uh, three-year work permit, uh, we have seen most of our MBA in students, MBA in India students getting those work permit as well in the past. Okay, awesome. Um, and uh, Imran, back to you. So how does uh, Rotman assist international students, especially when it comes to uh, employment and internships and all of that through the two years? Yeah, um, so Ananya, you know, um, Rotman's uh, two-year MBA program is actually the only um, full-time two-year program in Canada that actually, that has a, an internship that's built in as part of the curriculum. So it's yeah. a part of, you know, students get a credit for it, but it is an internship that students have to complete uh, in order to graduate. And it's typically a paid internship. So, um, you know, students are very busy in the first year, not only with their core classes, but also, you know, uh, networking and applying for, for internships and, and uh, you know, preparing for job interviews and things like that. Um, the re this was actually started about five years ago, the mandatory sort of, uh, we call it the flexible internship program, but uh, it's mandatory. Uh, it's flexible because students can choose to do it at any point in their second year. So you can do it in the 
summer term, fall or winter. Uh, most students, I think about 70% of students do it in the summer. That's just because, um, you know, uh, that's when some internships are available. Most companies you know, have sort of structured uh, internship placements in the summer. So, you know, the Career Center is very active working with students uh, throughout the first year, actually even before the students start. Um, so uh, a lot of the consulting firms uh, you know, uh, reach out to our, or want, want to start reaching out to our students early. Uh, so this year, I believe it was BCG that uh, launched their sort of summer internship program in June, you know, so the, so the career center uh, was, you know, they, they weren't planning on starting any of their programming until just before, um, you know, the orientation, but they had to move back their, their programming to get students prepared for uh, for the BCG internship, uh, you know, application and the workshop. Uh, and then, you know, uh, other, other firms followed suit. So I know Bain, we had a Bain um, uh, session with the students uh, in late June. Uh, McKinsey's on campus next week. So, you know, the Career Center is actively involved in getting students ready um, even before the program starts yeah. with resumes, cover letters, you know, um, the case case prep uh, because you know case interviews are part of the consulting interview process uh, but yeah you need to be you know sort of career ready on day one of the program um, so the career center is quite actively involved with onboarding the students as well as supporting them throughout the, the first year now you know they've also found that students who um, are able to complete an internship are three times more likely to have a full-time job uh, and that's what their research shows. So that's why it was actually made mandatory as part of the program a few years ago. Uh, and, and it's a huge ad, uh, you know, advantage to our students because uh, more, like about the, the conversion rate from internship to full-time is about 40%. So 40% of our students you know, go into the second year with a full-time job offer in hand. And then you know, they can, if, if that's the company that they wanted to work in you know, uh, from the get-go or that's the industry, then you know, they already have their job offer. If not, they can continue looking for other opportunities in the second year. Wow. What's interesting to note is how the um, you know, career center sort of moved the dates around as per the requirement in the industry. So that's, uh, I'm sure, it's really reassuring for all the students uh, yeah. listening in. Um, do you see most of your students go into, uh, like, what would be the top three industries where, where you see students uh, landing up with a job post the, post the MBA? Um, so, I, I, I mean, at Rotman, it's uh, predominantly, uh, so it's three industries, um, finance, consulting, and up until a few years ago, I would have said marketing, uh, but it's actually tech now that has kind of overtaken uh, just because of the booming tech sector in, uh, in and around Toronto. So uh, yeah, so I would say it's finance, consulting and tech. Yeah, wow, you got a, a thumbs up there from Karan. So I guess uh, it's, Karan it's is exactly similar. the same for us. It's yeah. exactly the same for us. It's finance consulting and then it's tech and yes uh, it's always been a tough war between marketing and tech but in the last couple of years what we have seen is tech is actually surpassing marketing awesome all right yeah. um so we'll also move on to the questions because uh, my chat box is absolutely buzzing with loads of questions coming in from students um so i'll start with the first one um i guess this is directed to both uh, you and imran so the student has given a bit of uh, their profile um, he's gotten a GMAT score of 770 and has graduated from a, um, uh, from a school that teaches in English. Uh, he is, I think the main question is about the English language requirements, um, specifically IELTS and TOEFL and whether uh, he would have to write that. Not required. Simple answer, not required. Perfect. I think Karen, it's the same, so I'll speak. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Not required. <laughs> yeah. awesome. if, 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 if the transcript says that it was uh, completed in English, we are good to go. Uh, we, we are fine without the test. Great. So I think, uh, Ravi, that's one thing you can sort of, uh, you know, cross out from your to-do list uh, while applying. All right. So um, then we have another student who said, who says that he works in the higher education space uh, with a previous background in the social sector uh, with about less than 5% representation in the class profile of the MBA batches. Is it slightly more challenging for me to get accepted? So that's the question. I don't think so. I mean, we, you know, we look for students with very 
industry and, and work, you know, work experience and education backgrounds. So, um, you know, I, like this year we have high school teachers in the program, you know, we have uh, uh, students or uh, I know, I, I know two students coming in with uh, education tech background. So it, it really isn't, you know, I think it, regardless of the industry or job you had, uh, before coming into the MBA, like making a career switch is definitely possible if that's the goal. Uh, but also if you want to continue working in the same sector uh, you know, uh, and just using the MBA as a way to skill yourself and uh, you know, get into the job market in Canada, that's also very much possible. Um, you know, the education sector is, uh, I mean, in Canada, it's, it's public. So all universities are, are sort of public institutions, but there, you know, there are a lot of startups in the, in the education sector as well, uh, if that's, uh, you know, the area of interest. So definitely possible. And, and we, we, you know, we, we have stu we have students in the program that are teachers. So. Right. I, 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 with, uh, with a, at business school, I think diversity is the key. It's not like, you know. Absolutely. Wouldn't find people. Yeah, from absolutely. Right. Yeah. I would imagine it's the same at. Um, absolutely, shooting. absolutely. The moment you tell me that, uh, as he mentioned, that with a, a less than five percent of presentation in the class, I yeah. guess that's where we realized that he would bring some diversity. So right. instead of uh, it, uh, instead of being challenging, it actually works in his favor. Perfect. Great. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that's reassuring. Um, also, another question that's come in that what holds more weight uh, when you're applying? Is it, um, is it more focused towards work experience when, when uh, you know, the admissions committee is reviewing your applications or is it more focused towards what academic scores you've got in the past? So, uh, I would say at, at a certain level, uh, when we talk about academics, so we have an eligibility criteria where you need to have at least the average uh, across your last two years of academic work, uh, two, at least two years of work experience or three years of work experience if you have done a three-year undergraduation degree. Once you clear the basic eligibility criteria, everything else is uh, valued at the same level. Right. So what, what, what I uh, mean to say here is if you have a lower GMAT score, but you you have other uh, things on your profile which are actually uh, helping you uh, send in your profile, it might work in your favor, right? right. But um, at not only one aspect, let's say if, if your GMAT score is very low and uh, like it's um, not even able to even meet the, uh, I would say even the eligibility what we have, the, the 550 uh, plus eligibility, even if you're not able to clear that eligibility, then it will be difficult. But right. let's say if you have a profile of 610, 620 in your GMAT, but exceptional uh, work done, great uh, work experience, so that, that is some way to actually compensate to that. But if you ask me to pick one of them, it's very difficult. Uh, we would actually look at all the parameters of your application before making a decision here. Right. But, Ananya, if, if I may, can I just follow up uh, on that question? It's okay. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Right. So my question was actually focused on, um, so uh, just a little background. My GMAT score is of 680. Um, mm -hmm. I actually teach mathematics and statistics. So um, I'm an assistant professor at a, actually, you can see my background. In fact, I forgot to change it because I was in a class before this. Um, but my question is more towards, so I have seven years of work experience, but would, but what I've been advised is maybe give another attempt at GMAT. Um, and with my quant scores high, obviously the world global is what is brought it down. Should I focus my energy towards that? Or I'm actually involved with, something outside of work, like setting up another business outside of work. Um, and hence with very limited time on my hands, very limited um, time to actually spend another attempt on, would it be wise? That's what my question was. Would a 680 score with an 8.5 on the IELTS be fine? Um, or is the work experience enough? Or is it, does it make my application strong? Or should I be looking at another attempt uh, just to be competitive? Because both the schools... Um, I mean, I am really looking forward to applying to, so. So, Mantan, uh, this is a call what you have to take uh, for yourself. If you think that you can improve your score drastically, again, going from 680 uh, to 710, 720, I'm sure you will have to put in a lot of efforts there in, in terms of your verbal aspect of your uh, test. So, if you think that you will be able to score well, if you, if you are landing, your, if your mocks are landing around 720, 730, then I would say, yes, it does make sense for you to actually uh, take GMAT again. 
But if not, if you think that there are other aspects on your profile which you can actually highlight during your interview or maybe during your essay as well, if that is a way you can use, go ahead with that. And uh, most, uh, I guess it's, uh, that's the case with you. Like we have one of the optional essays as well. So right. that is a specific section what you can use to highlight maybe why you scored 680 or if anything, which is one of the shortcomings on your profile. So Makes that's sense. the space what you could use that. So if you think your mocks are around 730, uh, 720, 730, then I would always ask you to go ahead and retake GMAT. Otherwise, just go ahead with your application. Got it. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, Manthan, any follow-up questions? I'd really encourage you to put it on the... Uh, no, 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 absolutely. Sorry about that. Thank you so no, much. No problem at all. Um, also, I think we have another question asking that um, post, post the MBA, uh, are recruitment options for uh, the social sector part, is that limited? Um, I, it's definitely uh, one of the niche areas, um, you know, at Rotman. It's not dominant like the other sectors, but there certainly are um, students who get into the, you know, uh, social sector after graduation. Um, I know we have a partnership with Mars, for example, Mars Discovery District. It's the, uh, you know, largest um, innovation hub in the world. They, they support a lot of startups, uh, social enterprises, social impact startups. So, uh, and a lot of those are actually started at Rotman. So, um, uh, you know, so there is definitely opportunity to get into the uh, social sector. We also have a a joint degree program. Uh, it's called the uh, Master of Global Affairs and MBA, which is yeah. done in partnership with the Peter Monk School of Business, uh, School of uh, the Peter Monk School at the University of Toronto. My apologies, I haven't had enough coffee this morning. <laughs> so yeah, so you know, uh, students who graduate from that program typically get into um, you know Global Affairs Canada, working with organizations like the UN, uh, the World Bank. Um, so yes, there are, there's definitely, and those, those organizations recruit from Rotman. So, uh, there's scope if, if you'd like to get into that sector for sure. Right. Right. Hello, uh, excuse me, Ananya, I'm sorry. Um, hi, Abhiyodai, sorry. Um, can we just request you to put your questions down on the chat? I'll get to it. Just actually, I've put it twice. Uh, actually, it was an yeah, important. Yeah, we're coming down. We're coming down to your can I, can I also just for everyone's benefit and Karan, you might want to do the same because if we can't get to all your questions now in the next, you know, 30 minutes, uh, we'd be happy to take them offline as well. So I'm going to just put in my, my email address. Uh, please get in touch with us. Uh, you know, it's, it's really hard for us right now to say, to do like profile evaluations because we don't have the complete picture, right? So for you to say, I have a, you know, 680 on my GMAT, what are my chances? It's impossible for me to give you an answer. Um, so uh, I will just leave you with that. Please get in touch with me. That's, uh, that's really great. Uh, it's a great idea, Karan. Uh, uh, sorry, Imran. And um, so for also uh, profile evaluations, I think we can send those uh, emails across separately. Okay. Great. Uh, so, Karan, we have a question for you, um, and that is that given the visa requirements and the uh, scholarships, etc., do you uh, suggest that someone should apply for the fall 2022 intake over the uh, winter 2022 intake, the January intake? That it's totally big. depends. Yeah, uh, that that totally depends on the career goals what the candidate has. If you have, uh, if you are already uh, have like serving a notice period at work, and if you have to join a business school by January, do that. Otherwise, if you can wait till fall, do that. There is no difference as such. Even if you're on campus, there okay. won't be any bifurcation between both the intakes. Uh, it's just that you would be graduating a couple of months later. So it totally depends on your personal choice and your uh, career goals, uh, whenever you want to join the program and whenever you would want to uh, complete your program. Uh, okay. Just one thing here is regarding the flexibility on the program. So uh, either you can complete your program entirely in 16 months, or you can opt for a break in between for four months uh, between your term two and term three. So year one and year two, you can opt for a break in between. And that's where you can do your internship. You may extend your internship from four months to eight months, depending on uh, your work then, and then come back to the program. So it totally depends uh, on you and your career goals. And the program is super flexible for you to accommodate with that. Perfect, perfect, sounds good. Um, and now we'll come to Abhiyodar's uh, question here. So he is an IIT graduate and um, is in the software development uh, space. So Excuse um, me, Ananya, I'm sorry. I'm not an IIT graduate. I'm a final year student. Okay, so you're a final year student. Sorry. Yes. 
Um, so how, how does he improve his chances to get, uh, get through to the MBA? I think it's an extension from the, uh, you know, the tech bit that we were talking about earlier, earlier in our, um, in our chat. Uh, I'm sorry if I, I've not got that completely. He is yet to uh, so graduate. He's, he's, and... currently, he's currently studying at IIT and right. um, he comes from a software development sort of profile. So any tips for him, any, uh, any ways to sort of improve his chances uh, to get through BC? He, he, he has much time right now. He has to graduate and then he has, uh, you will have to work for two years. Uh, I would say the only thing what you would have right now or the thing what you, you cannot change anymore is your academic whatever right. you have studied. The exams, what you're going to opt for in future, make sure you give your best so your academics are good once you graduate. And once you do that, uh, you have two years, wherever you're working, make sure that there is good work. Uh, you're able to learn quite a lot there. And um, yeah, prepare well for your GMAT and make sure you uh, answer your essay questions very well. So this, is, this might sound very generic because again, the kind of profile it is, uh, it's very generic for us. But these, these are the few things that you can keep in mind while you're applying. So you apply. So I wanted to ask actually that if I work in a software industry, so is it relevant to go uh, like, uh, what are my chances to get into an MBA school? Like, do I have to work in some consulting company or some what like generic? So, Abhir, there, I think just to reiterate what Imran and Karan have been saying, it's very difficult to, uh, you know, answer that question in, in a silo. I think they have to see your profile and there are lots of aspects of your profile that will matter eventually. So it's not like, I mean, and I mean, um, Imran and Karan, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there's any particular industry that, um, you know, you're not open to. to yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, uh, if I can just answer your question in a very general way so that it's, it's you know, um, applicable to everyone here. Um, we, we're not looking, so... At Rockman, we, we look at our applicants in four different buckets or components, okay? So the first is academics. Um, you know, uh, Karan said it's GMAT, GPA, uh, you know, we take GRE as well. Um, nothing you can really do about the GPA at this point. So, you know, to some degree, you can compensate for that with a, a stronger test score. Um, the next component we look at is, work, uh, is what we call the experience and impact, uh, focusing more on the impact part of it, not so much the number of years of work experience. So what we're really looking for is, you know, whether it's tech or consulting or banking, whatever industry or company you've, you've worked with prior to joining the program, we really care about the impact that you've made in those organizations. So, you know, have you had any career progression? Have your job responsibilities changed? from the time you started up until now? You know, have you shown any leadership initiative? Have you been involved in Um, we don't, um, you know, we want students from multiple different industries. So if you come in with a, you know, traditional like business background or, or tech background or engineering, that's totally fine. Uh, what we're really focused on is your value addition to your company and to your team uh, prior to coming into the program. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. So, um, and I think we have a few more questions about, uh, like, you know, people sort of giving their profiles. So just for the interest of everybody, Imran and Karan have uh, kindly dropped their um, uh, email IDs on the chat. So if it's about profile evaluation and getting more personalized feedback, please reach out to them um, individually. Um, so uh, Karan, we have uh, one question about the MBA in India. And I know you've already uh, said that the application process is exactly the same as the full-time MBA in Canada, but someone's asking, are the eligibility criteria in any way um, sort of different? Is, it, is there something uh, different that you're looking for people uh, joining the MBA in India program? Uh, it's absolutely the same, Ananya. Absolutely the same. Eligibility criteria, admission criteria, everything is the same. If, in, if you are applying for Toronto MBA or MBA in India, so it's right. exactly the same. Uh, you, you need to have 
a B uh, average in your academics, you need to have at least 550, but the uh, average uh, GMAT for the class is around 680, 690. So uh, that's uh, the case. And uh, if you have three years of undergraduate degree, you need to have three years of work experience to be eligible. But if you have four years of undergraduate degree, you could have two years of work experience as well. So it's the like same uh, for a Toronto MP as well as for uh, MBA in India. Perfect. So two years is the minimum, absolute minimum. Two years is minimum, yes. Yeah. Okay, but if so you have three years undergraduate degree, you need to have three years of work experience. Okay, perfect. Yeah. All right. And um, is there a minimum work experience for um, Rotman Iran? Yeah, it's, um, you know, uh, it's the same. It's two years uh, right. minimum. Years, our average in the program right now is uh, about five years. So the range uh, in our program is about two years. So I think this year the highest was 11 years in the program. Wow. And the average is about five. So yeah, I mean, two years, you're just barely scraping the minimum. Uh, most of our students have uh, you know, more than two years for sure. Wow, so um, absolutely a lot to learn from your uh, cohort other than just learning from your professors too with people with 11 years of work. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. For sure. Okay. Um, I think um, that brings us to the end of all our questions. But before I let the two of you go, um, what is one piece of advice that you would want to leave our students with? Uh, <laughs> as you know, someone having done the MBA myself, uh, I can just say, you know, um, go into the MBA with an open mind. You know, you may have uh, some somewhat of a plan or you know, some post MBA sort of career goal or aspiration, which is fantastic. But uh, you know, keep an open mind because you never know what opportunities may come your way. Uh, you, know, you may meet an alumni at, uh, you know, let's say you're interested in investment banking, but you meet an alumni at a networking event um, you know, in the tech space. Uh, and you, know, you may be an awesome fit for that, for that role or that company. So, Keep, yeah, just keep an open mind. And uh, I think, you know, the more you put into the MBA, the more you're going to get out of it. Um, the MBA is so much, you know, as we, as we go on, there's, uh, it's becoming less and less about the curriculum and the in-class, uh, you know, and it's more about the outside of class experience. So yeah. the more, you know, it's not just, an, it's not enough to just show up at, at class and do well and, you know, get good grades. Um, that's not uh, sort of a metric of success. I think the more time you spend outside of class, um, you know, getting to know your classmates, uh, meeting, you know, building your network, both on campus as well as off campus, uh, participating in clubs, case competitions, uh, experiential learning opportunities. You know, at Rotman, we offer in a two year span, we offer over a thousand experiential learning opportunities for our students. So, um, we encourage students to participate as much as they can uh, outside of the class, you know, as they would in class. And, uh, and I think that's the, you know, that's making the most of your, of the MBA experience. So that's my, my two cents. <laughs> Perfect. I think uh, that's super helpful uh, for all listening in. Uh, Karan, anything to add to that? Anything? Um... Yeah, I would actually echo what uh, Imran said. It's actually true. Uh, it's always good to have a good plan but it's very important to be open to unlearning as well because there are going to be so many things that you're going to come across and you need to unlearn and relearn as well. So have an open mind, be flexible if you are actually going for your MBA program and be flexible. Uh, there might be something that might come across your way and you might be keen, no harm in trying. One thing uh, which is uh, so important, there would be a lot of opportunities. And again, I guess gone are the days where we actually look at MBA as uh, just uh, uh, going to a classroom, getting your assignments, coming back home. I guess uh, that's not the MBA anymore. It's, it's more about what else are you doing apart from your curriculum. So there would be a lot of opportunities on campus. There would be clubs, uh, clubs you will be part of. There would be other networking events that you will be part of as well. So pay equal importance. Don't uh, only study and uh, get an uh, A grade on your assignment, but no, don't only concentrate on your uh, cultural activities or your club activities, but uh, rather have a balanced approach for all the uh, activities what you're going to do on campus. And don't try to take everything on your plate on the first uh, sem itself, first term itself. 
take it slow see uh, where you are good at and eventually decide and if you are still not sure about which specialization you would want to opt for i would be like that's the best part because uh, about 65 to 70 percent of the students they pursue their mba to change their function or a job function or, or industry so that's totally fine if you're not sure about your mba and even if you uh, say during your interview that you're not sure about the specialization what you are looking forward to that's totally fine because that's one of the reason you are coming to a business school to understand different parts of the business, different aspects of the business, and eventually take a decision going forward. Yeah. So I would say be open to unlearning. That that could be one single advice uh, which could be given to everyone. Yeah. Wow, that's uh, that's I think uh, perfect and the best note to sort of uh, uh, bring an end to our webinar. Thank you so much for making the time. Uh, hopefully, the two of you will see a lot of familiar names from our webinar. Uh, you know, sending absolutely ace applications across. And uh, for all the students, any further questions, feel free to reach out to help at reachiv.com. And um, also, again, reiterating, Imran and Karan have left their uh, email IDs on the chat. So if you want profile evaluations individually from the universities, please feel free to do that. Um, otherwise, that's about it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for making the time this uh, morning. And um, yeah, all the best. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Amalia. Um, Thank you, Imran. Thank you, everyone. Great, great guys. connecting with you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I was just going to, you know, uh, just going to say, like, this is a, uh, an in initial conversation or an introduction. Um, you know, we look forward to hearing from all of you guys um, and, and continuing this conversation afterwards. So uh, if we don't hear from you, then, uh, you know, wish you all the best. Good luck with the uh, admissions process. And I hope you have an amazing MBA experience. Uh, <laughs> wow, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Uh, wishing you both good days ahead now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You too. Bye. Bye.